good evening everyone on behalf of the parkinson's disease and movement disorder society it is my great pleasure to invite you all for this very exciting that we were eagerly waiting for this webinar with david leventhal parkinson's disease and movement disorder society is an all india charitable society improving the lives of people with parkinson's and their families in india since 2001 through our multidisciplinary model of care which includes physiotherapy speech therapy dance therapy art and music therapy and many more here is a short video to give you the glimpses of the work of pdmds before and during the pandemic of covid-19 
Once again, I welcome everyone who is present here today and has joined us for this webinar. And now I would like to invite Dr. Maria Barreto, the CEO of PDMDS, to invite our distinguished speaker and guest for today. Thank you, Tejali. On behalf of Dr. Singhal, it is my pleasure to welcome the celebrated teacher and dancer, David Leventhal. Thanks, David, for graciously accepting the invitation to be with us today and welcome to India, even though it is on this virtual platform. The PDMDS conducts activities and programs using a multidisciplinary approach for our members, both at the physical support groups, pre-pandemic, and now through our online sessions. But from my observation, the sessions conducted on dance and movement have the most enthusiastic response. And the joy and happiness experienced is evident from the wholehearted participation. We've been really looking forward to this webinar and I'm sure it's going to be an enjoyable learning experience. Welcome, David. Dr. Brito, thank you so much for the warm welcome and for the invitation to, to be with you virtually. I wish I could be there in person, and we will look forward to the day when that is possible. But in the meantime, it's, a, it's an honor to be here with you and to be here with all of the attendees. Uh, the work that you do is internationally renowned. We, we recognize your work here in the United States uh, as a member of the World Parkinson Congress and Coalition. We recognize the amazing work that you do, so it's, uh, it's very... Uh, good for us to be able to contribute to that and to connect with you. I'm going to be talking today about the impact and importance of dance for people living with Parkinson's who want to manage uh, their lives with dignity, with a sense of grace, with a sense of musicality. I'm going to be talking for about 25 minutes to give an overview uh, about what we know about the impact of dance on Parkinson's. And then we're going to be doing a live demonstration. And I'm going to invite all of our attendees to join in whatever way is comfortable for you to, uh, to do some dancing with me. Because I think one of the really important things to do as someone living with Parkinson's is to try things out, to see what works for your particular situation and your body. And for those of you who are already dancing, you know about the power of this art form to transform your experience of living with Parkinson's. For those of you who have not danced before, I hope to uh, introduce you to some of those benefits and um, perhaps uh, show you why dance can be a vital part of living well with Parkinson's. I feel that I'm at an advantage because in India, dance uh, and music are such an important part of the culture. They are ingrained within the culture. Uh, you have such a strong tradition of dance, uh, a tradition that we here in the United States uh, envy and look upon with, uh, with, with great admiration. So uh, you already have that in, in your culture and it's a question of realizing that you can harness that uh, to support your experience with Parkinson's. So I'm going to uh, bring up some images and slides here so that uh, we can uh, kind of go through this together. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to just uh, go back here for a moment. Um, and do that. All right. So I wanted to actually start with a brief video just because I think for dance to be able to see other people with Parkinson's moving and dancing in a group environment can be a very empowering experience. You'll, you'll hear from some of our participants here in Brooklyn, New York, um, as well as some of our medical advisors talking about the importance of dance. And then I'll go on and, and do some, uh, some more introductions. 
The motivation for starting a dance class for people with Parkinson's came from the desire to help people remember who they are is still the most important component of their existence, not Parkinson's. At first didn't want to do it because I thought I'd be associating with a lot of people on the stage of Parkinson's that I didn't want to be at and that would be discouraging to me. But I finally went and I've never regretted the decision that I made. Medicines can't always do as much as we want, so I've been recommending people for years and years to take dance for PD. I see transformation happen in front of my eyes. So people often come into the class with a lot of rigidity, and suddenly in that space, they come alive. My hands are so stiff I can't straighten my hand out. You know, just start moving gently and all of that stiffness goes away. There is something magical that takes place in there. I'm not sitting there thinking about my body. I'm just trying to move. I hear from my patients when they come back how much it seems to support and sustain them emotionally. I look to the rest of the group for inspiration. We are there for moral, spiritual, emotional support. When I came in, I really didn't even have a chance to be skeptical because the group immediately embraces you. It's a time when you connect and you don't have to be embarrassed because everybody else has a problem too. <laughs> gives people the courage to leave their apartments and go somewhere else and have a different kind of experience than they do when they're alone, which ends up being a lot of the time. When someone shakes hands with someone who can hardly hold their hand up, they're honoring the humanness of the individual. The feeling I get from being in this group is a feeling that it's going to be hard to replace with any other activity. So I hope uh, it lasts as long as I do. No matter what stage you are or what your previous experience has been with exercise or movement, you belong here. Come try it once, do a few moves, enjoy the music, enjoy the sense of community, you're gonna to wanna to come back. So what I wanted to talk about to start with is this idea of dance building on the elements of exercise. I think a lot of us now are familiar with the benefits and power of exercise. It is something that your neurologists talk to you about. It is something that your physical therapists talk to you about. And, uh, what I wanted to say here is that dance is an excellent form of exercise, but it builds so many layers on top of the standard exercise intervention that it makes it quite a different and special experience. So if you think about a typical treadmill workout uh, or a walk in the park, for those of you who are not using treadmills, um, comparing that to the steps that Mr. Gene Kelly is taking in Singing in the Rain, right? He's taking steps, he's walking, but it's a very different kind of experience. It's a joyful experience. It's an emotional experience. His movements have meaning. And that is one of the big differences between uh, dance and exercise. And I thought I would just take a break here uh, to stop sharing and go through a very short experiment with you. So I hope you will come along on this journey with me and see if we can transform together movements that you might do in a stretching class or an exercise class into dance and to see how that feels. Okay, so uh, I'm going to back up just a little bit so you can see more of my body and I'm just going to invite you to take your hands and just stretch your wrists for a moment here. So just allow your fingers to drop down I know a lot of us right now are on the computer for many hours a day. And so to get a little bit of stretching and mobility in your fingers and wrists is a really good thing. So just getting that into our hands. And I want you now to flip your hands, get a little bit of what we call rotation in your forearms, something you might do actually in the neurologist's office as well. This is part of the, uh, U-P-D-R-S. So just flipping over, right. And then I want you to think about stretching your hands forward. 
and stretching your hands a little lower and stretching your hands lower and just bring it up get one more stretch all the way to the top and come around all right so i talked you through just a basic stretching pattern right i used very mechanical language but now I'm going to add the layers of dance. What makes dance special? What gives it the power? Why can it help you uh, in the way that it can living with Parkinson's? So the first thing I'm gonna talk about is imagery. Dancers use imagery to talk about our movement. And we see this in all forms of dance. It's very strongly present in many classical Indian forms of dance because they are gestural and narrative forms. They are forms that tell a story. So our movement in dance is telling a story. So instead of just stretching, I want you to use this image. I want you to use this image of dolphins. So thinking about those dolphins and thinking about those dolphins leaping into the water, Right? So we went from a stretch into an idea, an image, thinking about those dolphins jumping into the water, right? Now, instead of just flipping your hands, I would like you to offer or receive a gift. For me, that changes the movement from an exercise into a dance, a gesture. So, I have my dolphin jump, my dolphin dive. I am offering a gift, or maybe I'm receiving a gift. And then I don't want to think of this so much as a stretch, but I would like you to use this image and have this image in your mind. This is standing on stage in a theater. And when I think about this, space and this meaning i am reaching to the very back of that balcony see that balcony all the way up there there's some folks sitting up there right those are the people that you're trying to reach with your arm stretch so it's not an internal goal i'm trying to stretch my arms it's an external goal right it's performative and that motivates me to reach with the biggest gesture i possibly can if I know that I have to reach to that audience, oh, I'm gonna give a lot more energy and power to my movements. And there's the middle balcony, and there are the people in the orchestra, and there's the conductor, and I'm reaching to all of them and thanking them for their beautiful participation. All right, so imagery and projection. I call this projection, this idea of sending your energy out to an audience. These are things that dancers use all the time. Because, of course, dance is a performing art. So we have to think about what are we trying to say and how are we trying to say it, okay? There are two other elements that will help you think like a dancer. One of them is sequencing movement. You see this all the time in classical Indian forms and in modern forms like Bollywood. One movement comes after the next. So instead of just thinking about this as repetitive str stretching, same move over and over again, I'm going to think about my movements as a sentence. And here's how my sentence goes. One, two, three, four. It has four parts. My dolphin dive on the other side, offer my gift, bring it back to my heart. My second phrase reaches. We know this one already. But now it flows together into one big sequence of movement. And that is what dancers and musicians call a phrase. So all of us can think of our movement as phrases, as a way to support our movements. You can think about walking across the floor as a phrase of movement. It's not just made up of isolated single steps, but it is a sequence that carries you through and can help support you. You are all your own choreographers, okay? The last element, of course, is music. And so music ties all of this together, the imagery, the projection, and the sequencing into a delicious package, a delicious experience. So what happens when we try this 
with music. Well, this is actually movement from a dance choreographed by Mark Morris, who is a choreographer that I worked with for many years. And uh, Mark made up this movement in partnership with the great cellist Yo-Yo Ma. This was a project that they worked on together. So I'm going to do this now with music and I invite you to try it with me if you'd like. Let's go. Let's try it one more time. So I think you can see the way the music ties everything together and it gives the movement a meaning, an emotion, a sense of quality. That is the magic of dance. And that is how we transform exercise movements and stretching movements into a physical, expressive experience, right? Um, and of course, I think what you could also see in the music is that the quality of the music informs the movement. So people with Parkinson's often tell me, I'm losing this, the quality of my movement. I feel like I don't have a range. I have a movement that feels like a monotone. It's one tone. Dance has the ability to draw out different qualities of, of your movement. So you can start to experience a wide range of different kinds of movement, different qualities, and different ways of moving. And this gives you back a sense of control and a sense of power and even a sense of joy in your movements. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more now about our experience as dancers and to invite you to think about this. And I think this is particularly important when there's such a strong tradition of performance in dance, as there is in, in the US and India. We go and they see these wonderful performances by great artists. But the thing that we need to focus on as people living with Parkinson's is the process those dancers use to train, because that process is incredibly valuable for us as people with Parkinson's. We want to think like a dancer. We want to use the strategies of a dancer. And here they are again, just in case you missed them the first time. Number one, leveraging imagery. Thinking about imagery in your daily life, what imagery, what imaginative cues can you use to support your movement? Number two, choreographing and planning your movement. This is particularly important for people who might have some freezing of gait or feel that they are shuffling in their walking. If you can plan your steps, if you can think about the quality of your steps, you have taken your way, your, your mind into the conscious zone. You are no longer relying on automatic movement. And of course, it's the automatic movements that become much more difficult in Parkinson's. So thinking like a dancer is about going from the automatic into a very conscious, mindful approach to every movement. And then, of course, once you do that and practice it, you can try to go back to the automatic. Performers are not thinking about every move. They have rehearsed for many, many hundreds of hours. So they are used to doing those movements. But at the beginning, of course, they have to think about every single movement. Let music be your guide. Music is a wonderful friend for all of us, particularly people with Parkinson's, because music is like a coach. It tells you how to move. It tells you when to move. It tells you how big to move. It tells you the story you're trying to tell through your movement. And as I said, projecting and performing your movements can be incredibly helpful. This is useful for our participants when they're trying to speak with somebody and their movements are here, but they really want to tell a story like this. They want to gesticulate. And so if you can think about performing and letting energy come out of your movements, 
then you're going to have an easier time communicating and expressing yourself in daily life. So these were the thoughts that went behind the Dance for PD program. This is Oli Westheimer here in the middle. And Oli is the visionary who brought the idea of Dance for Parkinson's to the Mark Morris Dance Center here in Brooklyn, New York. And this started in 2001, so we're coming up on 20 years of offering this program in New York and in 25 countries around the world, including in India. My colleague, Horishikesh Awar, who's based in Pune, uh, has a wonderful program at the Sanchetti Clinic, and he is uh, very active in promoting Dance for PD in, uh, in, in India. So I can certainly refer you to him if you're interested. Um, here is a, a map showing all of the, the places where Dance for PD exists. And I think the thing that has um, tied us together is that people living with Parkinson's around the world share similar challenges. Most people think of Parkinson's as a movement disorder. I'm not going to go too far into this because I think a lot of you are aware of it, but things like tremors, balance issues, stiffness, changes in speech, voice and swallowing, slowness of movement. And in this way, dancers and dance programs are very well equipped to address the physical elements of what you're going through. Uh, because dance is a physicalized art form. We are using our bodies. And so we are addressing many of the things that people living with Parkinson's need to work on. Things like balance, coordination, intention. How do you begin a movement? Weight shift, right? Stamina, turning, amplitude. These are things that we work on in every dance style and every dance setting. And I always say it doesn't matter what style of dance you're working on because all styles share a common DNA, a common structure that, um, that makes these basic skills and, and elements present in all of those forms. But there's also a Parkinson's iceberg because a lot of the things that you are living with are not as visible. They are not necessarily physical symptoms, but they are non-physical, non-motor symptoms. Things like apathy, the uh, clinical manifestation of not wanting, not driven to do anything, not having the initiative to do anything, a very common symptom of Parkinson's. Social isolation. Social isolation is a particular problem now during COVID when people are stuck at home and there are lockdowns and it's very challenging, particularly for older adults and particularly for those living with Parkinson's. Another aspect is, I would say, a change or loss of identity. The way that you identified yourself as a, the kind of work that you did or the role that you had in your family uh, or the role that you had in your community. Sometimes that can change when you're living with Parkinson's and that can be a very difficult transition as you transition away from being able to work. Wonderfully, dance brings together all of these elements. So it's not just a physical form, it is a cognitive form. We have to think and use cognitive skills to execute movement, as we just did a few minutes ago. It is an expressive and emotional experience. So it's a way of drawing out somebody's inner voice, their expression. What do they want to say with their bodies? Maybe it's something serious. Maybe it's something humorous. Dance gives us an opportunity to speak with our bodies. And finally, social. Dance, even on Zoom, is an interactive activity. It asks us to look at others, dance with others, connect, gesture. In the studio, when we're together, we're holding hands. We're doing partner dances. We're dancing in circles, we're dancing in lines. The social component is a vital aspect of the class, not only because it is good for us emotionally and psychologically, but because it is a motivator. Even when you may have apathy and you don't feel like getting out of bed, the knowledge that there are people waiting for you to dance with you is a very strong motivator. And what we've seen and what you saw in the video that I started with is the sense that dance brings people together. It, it, it motivates them to come and join in a social experience. And all of our participants come to class for a different reason. 
Some come because it gives them a sense of hope, a sense of belonging. Some come because they know that they are working on very important physical skills. Others are working more on emotional uh, experiences. They find that the class enhances their mood and sense of well-being. Now, I could talk about all of this, but I want to refer also back to the research, because the research on dance and Parkinson's from around the world is quite robust at this point. When we started 20 years ago, we had no research. We were just experimenting. But now, more than 40 peer-reviewed studies on the impact of dance on Parkinson's have been published, have been out there. And what we're seeing is that they point to benefits related to both motor and non-motor elements. So things like gait, tremor, rigidity, functional mobility, balance. We're also seeing some research now on the impact of dance on executive function, so things like cognitive skills and, and memory. We're looking at a general quality of life as well as elements of social inclusion, self-esteem, and mood. Um, and there is, a, again, a robust literature. Now 42 studies, so there are just two that came out in the last few months. Um, eight of those are randomized controlled trials, so the gold standard of, of clinical research. So a lot of people say, well, doctor, I'm not sure if I should be dancing. Um, I, I'm not sure if there are benefits. Neurologists now have the evidence. They have the evidence to say this is a valuable and beneficial activity. And that is why I think Dance for PD exists around the world. It is not only because it fills a niche for people with Parkinson's and hits a lot of the elements and symptoms that people want to work on, but dance is an international language. It is something that is spoken around the world. And what is unique, I think, about our program is that we ask our teachers to adapt and, and uh, transform the content of the classes to make them accessible and enjoyable by people in their local communities. So I'm going to be doing a blend of dance styles today, but the dance teachers in India are using primarily Indian dance forms. The dance teachers in Korea down here are using traditional Korean dance and some modern dance and ballet as well, which is a big part of, of the Korean dance culture. So wherever you are, the dance class itself speaks to you and your cultural and musical preferences. Right now, we are offering all of our programming online. So we offer Zoom classes during the week. We also have on-demand video on our website. People can go and just participate in a class on their own schedule. And in North America, we have a dance by phone option. This might be something to consider in India as well, where there are a number of people who do not have access to the internet and only have a, have a phone. Through this program, people can call a number and hear a dance activity that is spoken to them with some music that they can dance to. There are benefits to this. I very much miss the experience of being in the studio. However, for the online classes, no travel is necessary. You can participate from home where you are. The majority of our dancers are coming into our online classes many more times during the week than they might ordinarily if it were live in the studio. Sometimes we have people coming to the studio once a week, maybe twice a week. But now we have two, three, four times a week that people are, are coming into class. The class is also a way for people to be private, right? So people can turn off their cameras to participate. They do not have to necessarily show their name. And that's attractive for people who maybe are a little bit shy about uh being public with their Parkinson's, maybe they're a little bit shy about dancing. And though this, this opportunity now that we have online allows them part to participate with, with privacy intact. So I'm gonna argue that uh, you can think like a dancer every day. So it's not just a theoretical concept, but you, for example, can use imagery to help you get out of bed in the morning. Is there a specific image that you can use that inspires you? Perhaps it's about the sunrise. Perhaps it's about a tree putting its roots down into the soil, and that connects you with the floor, gives you a sense of confidence, and allows you to get out. Whatever that image is, keep a toolkit of images in your back pocket and bring those images up when they might be useful to you. 
if you're in the, the grocery store, the market, and you're having trouble negotiating those steps, think about choreographing your way through the crowd, through um, the store, so that you have a less likely chance of getting stuck. If you can plan your movements, if you can think ahead of time, you can use that skill to help you keep moving. Music as a guide, do you have music on your phone? Do you have music in your head? Do you have music on your stereo at home? If not, I encourage you to choose a couple things that you love, music that you find inspiring, and have that music available to support you in your everyday movements. Things like walking, things like cooking, things that become more difficult as we live with Parkinson's, Use music and use the rhythm in that music to support your movements. And as I said before, projecting your gestures, thinking about that balcony very far away from you and making sure your movements are big enough to be seen by the people in that balcony in the back of the theater. I'm gonna share one last story here. Uh, this is somebody who is in our Brooklyn program, New York. And what I love about Cindy's story is that she has fully embraced the power of thinking like a dancer, all right? You'll hear her talk about the way that dance helps her think differently about her body. It helps motivate her to take better care of herself. This is Cindy Gilbertson, and this is from a film called Capturing Grace, directed by Dave Iverson. to value myself more, which is quite a gift. When I'm slumping, I say to myself, I'm a dancer. I have to sit up straight. I am a dancer. And it, it gives me motivation to take better care of myself. When the medicine is working, I can almost do everything. It's just that the amounts of time there get shorter and shorter when it functions. Parkinson's forces you to reveal your vulnerabilities. You know, otherwise people mostly try to put on their best face, their best appearance. You know, I'm going out in public, I have to put on this and that, and I have to put my overcoat button it uptight. Well, you can't, if you're going with Parkinson's and you can't button it, you're, you're revealed, you know, there's no way about it. What happens to me when my feet feel like glue and they're stuck on the floor? I sometimes cannot walk, but I can dance. If I, I can, um, I don't know, I can give you an example. Should I start? Yeah. Well, for example, Right now, I'm, I'm off. You can see my hand is shaking. I have the tremor. And if I try to walk, I have a great deal of difficulty. Um, I could walk a little bit. But if I pretend I'm dancing, I could go. And I don't have any problems. The music leads. In other words, it's not my brain telling me to take a step or to do this or do that. The music is leading me. So I'm like following this wonderful leader who's so mysterious and has such a lovely sound and it's gonna take me to some other place. What is that other place? Um. <sighs> well, excuse me. It's a place where um, you're weightless, you know, you just, your body is just, um, it just flies. It 
it doesn't tug at you, <laughs> tug you and pull you and push you and, um, you know, have you. And these knots where you can't move and you can't think and you're struggling and fighting, it just, you know, you, you, you go above that. All right, and I'm just having a little contact information here before I forget, because at the end of class, it will feel, uh, I won't want to show any slides then. So this is, <laughs> this is our contact information, a website, and uh, an email if you have any questions. Um, we're going to start in, and I, I will take some questions at the, at the end, so please, uh, please keep those and, and share them through. Uh, the Q and A or through the chat. Um, I'm going to go into a little bit of a dance uh, experience so that we can dance together. I can't see most of you, but I'm going to imagine that you're all dancing in your homes, uh, perhaps with a, a loved one near you, or perhaps by yourself. Either way, um, we are going to be seated today because I cannot see you, and it's just a bit safer for us to experience it that way. Um, but our classes are both seated and standing. We typically start in a chair. Uh, some programs are, are starting on the floor, but most are starting in a chair. And then uh, for those people who are comfortable, we will progress to standing. However, all of our classes, all of our activities can be done fully seated. And this enables people living with Parkinson's to participate throughout the spectrum of their Parkinson's experience. People participate in our classes for their entire time with Parkinson's, regardless of what level they're at, regardless of what level of mobility they're at. And that is a really important part of our program because once you're part of our family, you stay in our family. The reason that people stop coming is usually that they cannot travel anymore. They can't get to the program. Of course, now people can simply turn on their computers or their phones and participate virtually. Uh, so please be safe, be comfortable. I, I want everything today, today to be joyful for your body. If there's something that doesn't feel right for your body, please feel free to, to modify it and to change it in any way that is comfortable for you. I'm actually going to start with a couple of images on the screen because we're going to be doing some painting together, all right? And I would like for you to use your imagination. So you, you will still see me in a small square on the, on the side, but I want you to bring the painting that you're seeing into your room. What do I mean by that? Oh, do you want me to stop for a second? Uh, no. Yeah. So, uh, okay. David, sorry to interrupt. Uh, would you like to have a few participants joining with their cameras on for this segment? If and that if that is possible, that would be wonderful. Yeah, we would add a few participants in the panelist uh, room. Yeah, okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you. Those of you who would like to uh, become a panelist and dance with David here with your camera on you can raise your hands uh, with the option of raise hands that you can see on the screen of zoom and then we would add you to the panelist and you can start your camera thank you thank you so much this is a this is such a treat to be able to to dance with you and actually see some other people often when I do these webinars it's uh dancing into the into the uh the dark theater i can't see anybody yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which feels familiar as a performer we are often performing to a dark theater where the lights are off but to, to be able to have some some folks come in is wonderful hello i see pranav welcome i see el filomena hello welcome The Gobind, Sinath, hello, welcome. Thank you so much for joining. And some other people coming in. Isaria, hello. Great, so lots of people coming in. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. It helps me a lot. It helps to be able to 
really feel that we are a community dancing together because the community right. part of our program is such an important part. Absolutely. All right. Great. I know people are still coming in, which is fantastic. Uh, I'm going to, to move, move forward as, as people are joining. And um, let's, uh, yeah, and there are also questions coming in. So I will, um, I will address those questions. I will be sure to leave some time at the end for questions. Um, great. So I'm going to bring back uh, just this, this slide here for a moment. And we're going to go into our painting. This is our first painting. And I'd like us to think now about extending those lines. So find a line in that painting you really like and see if you can continue that line beyond the screen. See if you can continue it out to your room. Drawing the colors of that line on your wall, on your ceiling. You can start with one hand. You can then switch to the other hand. And when you're feeling comfortable, you can start to bring in both hands. If you get lost, you can go through the painting again and pick up one of those lines. And I want you to think about the colors that you're tracing. Is it a red? Is it a yellow? Is it an orange? Really see it clearly. Start to mark up your room and even your own body. Can you, can you paint on your own body a little bit? Your arms, your hands. Now, I'm switching to a very different style of painting. Let's see if we can try to capture that linear style in our own movement. So thinking about lines and corners and little dots of color, the squares that you see. How does this feel for us? Maybe a little bit tighter for us in our bodies. So see if you can find, even in the lines, a sense of flow and a sense of smoothness. Yeah. And one more idea here, splatter. Can you release paint from your fingertips? Send it out. Splatter your walls with color. Let that paint jump off of your fingertips. You can even try to splatter somebody else in the room. Or splatter paint on your own, own body a little bit. Using one hand or both hands. Yes. Now taking a moment just scraping all of that paint, bring it into a little ball of color, allowing your hands to gently knead like a like bread dough, kneading that color ball. And now taking dabs of that color and smearing it out onto your walls, smearing with your entire hand, feeling the paint on your fingers. Finding a sense of flow through the movement. You can almost hear the sound of that paint. Nice. Very good. All right. Great, everybody. Lovely. So I'm going to move back a little bit so you can see me a little bit more clearly. And we're going to go into a nice, gentle warm up. We call it, kind of call this a sun salutation which uh, we base gently on, on yoga. Uh, the idea is really to allow your body to start to move gently and to start to get a sense of flow. It's also a way for you to expand your movements. 
So sometimes I find our participants in New York, the movements, when they come into the room, they're quite tight. And I want to find that sense of openness and flow. So just give me one moment here as I, uh, as I go back a little bit and you can see my chair here. The first thing I want you to think about is really anchoring your feet into the floor. So taking a moment to press your weight down into the floor, almost like a tree finding its roots in the soil. Because even though we're gonna be mostly moving with our upper bodies now for the first part of this class, I, um, I always want us to feel anchored to the floor. This is a big part of, of many forms of dance uh, this idea of reaching to the heavens while you are grounded to the floor. So we as humans are mediating that conversation between gravity and the sky. We are in between. And so we have to be connected to both. We're going to start with some really nice gentle circles. And again, whatever is comfortable for you. So if the movement feels too big, you can make it a little smaller, that's okay. And allowing one arm gently floating up. Same on the other side. Gentle circle. Like you're stirring a big pot of soup. Floating up. Gently reaching. Swooping down like you're touching the water for a moment and coming back up. And now opening from your heart. Letting light come into your heart. And again, opening and in. You're going to take a little wave, trying to wave to somebody you see on the screen. Hey. Nice, big, slow wave. And now offering your heart to somebody, reaching out to them. Beautiful. And now asking someone to come over to you. Hey, come here. So a really big gesture. Come over here. I have something to say. Let's put all of this together. So we have a wave, a reach, and now calling somebody to you. Let's try that on the other side. So we have a wave. I see you. Will you come over and meet me? Let's try that a little faster. Wave. Reach. Come over. Nice. Again. Wave. Reach. Come over. Can we try both hands? Wave, reach, come here. One more time. Wave, reach, come here. Great. Scooping low, bringing your hands together and opening to the sky like a giant flower. Allowing the sunlight to fill your heart and your arms and your chest. Let's try that one more time from the bottom, coming all the way up and opening as wide as you can. Long fingers, softening your elbows down. Great. Let's go back to our very first idea. Floating that hand up. 
and gently pressing down. Same on the other side, circle. See if you can make your circles a little bit bigger now. Right, allowing that hand to float. And gently pressing down. And back to our swings. Great. Now I'd like you to add a little circle with that. So I'm just circling in my elbows, finding that nice, smooth, fluid circle. Imagine that you're brushing your arms through warm, beautiful water. So you're really allowing that quality of water into your movements. And reaching again, allowing light to come into your heart, bringing your hands into your heart and taking a gentle bow. Beautiful. All right, good. So now that we've had that sense of flow in our upper bodies, we're going to bring that same idea down to our feet. Now, I know a lot of us are tentative to, to use our feet and, and to really think about our feet as expressive elements, but our feet are, uh, are equal parts. They deserve the attention as well as our hands. And um, I think particularly uh, in, well, in uh, many Indian forms, uh, Bharatnatyam, Katak, uh, the feet are such an important expressive element. Um, I'm actually going to be drawing from a different form today. This is from Argentine tango. Um, and we're going to be working on one element of tango, which is the, it's called an adorno. An adorno is kind of an improvised element of tango. So it's something that partners will do uh, when they are standing with each other and they do these little circles sometimes even lifting the foot off the floor right you've probably seen tango dancers doing this kind of activity if you've ever seen tango so we're going to be working with that idea of adorno and i want you to go back to the painting we did earlier right i was brushing the f the canvas with my paintbrush now i'm thinking of the paintbrush in my feet so you can draw circles, you can draw a figure eight with your feet. You can even lift your foot up a little bit off the floor. There's no set pattern. If you want a set pattern, you can absolutely do a circle or figure eight. Some people like to write their names with their feet, okay? But the, the goal here is to create a powerful, smooth flow of movement in our feet. We're also going to do direction. So we're going to go front, side, and back. A little bit harder in the chair, but that's okay. You can just slide your foot back. Those will be our tango directions. And then I'm going to bring in one other element, which is not from tango. It's just uh, from Latin dance. It's called cha-cha. Cha-cha goes like this. Slow, slow, quick, quick, slow. That's the cha-cha rhythm. So one, two, one, two, three. Now, as you know, tango is a partner dance, so we will also have a dip of our partner, imaginary, and the other side. This is a really great way to start to feel the, the, the way your, your feet can take weight, right? So a lot of people say, oh, you're just sitting, so you're not practicing your balance. Actually, a lot of the work we do in the chair is getting ready to balance in class and in our life. So when I go forward, I have a nice wide base. I'm allowing my weight to go into my feet, and then I'm pushing the floor away. This is one of the most important skills that we dancers can teach people with Parkinson's. Instead of lifting your back to come up, I am pushing the floor to come up. So I'm sending weight and energy down through my feet, and that brings me back up. Okay, so I'll talk about more when we get there. Let's try our tango. Do you have any music playing, David, for this? Because uh, we oh. can't really hear the music if uh, 
if you want to play some music with it. Did you not hear music before? Uh, not very really clearly. Oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Sorry about interrupting. that. No, I'm glad you did interrupt. Um, yeah, there was there was wonderful uh, Indian music actually on. Well, let me let me just do a little bit mm -hmm. just so you can kind of get in the mood. Um, a little bit of our sun salutation. You you heard a little bit, yeah. Uh -huh. um, let me let me go back just a little bit uh, to the end, and we'll just finish so that you can hear it, and then we'll go into our tango. Sorry about that. Yes. Just again, reaching out. Can you hear it now? Bringing our hands in. Yes, it's it's audible now. Beautiful. And again, reaching out, opening, and bringing it in, and coming in. And opening out. Great. And bringing one hand across. And open. And across. And open. And bringing everything in. Big embrace. And open. And one more time, giving yourself a big hug, just embracing both sides, and open. And now, just bringing attention down into your feet. Pressing that weight down, because we're going to be moving our feet in our tango in just a moment. Pressing your weight down, allowing your feet to spread into the floor. Good. Great. All right. Excellent. So now that was just our little. That was that was the music that was going. Let's go into our tango now. So starting to circle. Good. And now see if you can find another pattern with your feet. Whatever you'd like to do. Anchoring this foot. And now using the other side, binding those circles. Again, there's a lot of nice flow in the movement, finding those sketches on the floor. Let's go back to our first foot and add the same arm. So the arm and foot are working together. Switching to the other side. Great. Let's go into our direction. So we go front and down and side and down. Great. And a little bit back and in. Good. And side. Same thing on the other side. Really reaching front. Trying to reach for something that is just a little bit past your range. Trying to pick up that piece of paper behind you. Oh. And reaching to somebody across and in. Now our cha-cha. Slow. And slow. Quick. Quick. Slow. Really make an impression in the floor. So every beat counts. One, two, three. Let's try that one more time. Strong. 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 Good. Almost like you're splashing water. There's water going out from under your feet. The bigger you drop, the bigger you splash. Now opening your feet a little bit. And we're going to take a dip. And pressing into the floor to come back. Taking your partner to the other side, dipping your partner. And pushing into the floor to come up. One more time. We're going to go over and dipping down. 
pushing the floor, bringing your partner over to the other side, making sure your arms are nice and round so you can really hold someone. Good. Let's go back to our Adornos. This time, opposite hand from foot. So, good. Keep that going. Reaching far and near. Getting ready to switch. So this foot and this hand. Here we go. Keep the movement swirling, listening to the music. What is the quality of the music and what is it telling you to do? Excellent. All right. Really good. We're going to do two more things. Uh, the first is really a, a hand dance. So this is going to have some, some gestures, but it's going to be a little bit more percussive than what we just did. We were just moving in this wonderful state of flow and smooth kind of watery movement. Now we're going to really direct our movements, and then we're going to take that quality into our last dance, which will be a little bit of a, of a, Broadway, a Broadway number. All right, so let's try this all together, just following along. And here we go. Starting with a jab. Same on the other side. It's like you're trying to poke somebody. Hey, trying to get their attention. And now you're going to turn the lights on. Flash. 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 Good. Bring your hands together. And open. And together. Back to the beginning. Same on the other side. Out. 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 Good. Ready to flash like a flash bowl. Take a photo. Take a photo. Take a photo. Good. Nice. Bring it in. Like a symbol. Symbol crash. Good. Low to high. Across. Take that flash bowl and send it up over your head. Same on the other side. Good. Now both sides. Low. Middle, high, and you're going to smear your paint down again. We're going to go low, middle, high, smear it down, brush your knee, point, tap your head, and circle. Again, brush, point, tap, circle, other side we go, brush, point, tap, and circle, brush, point, head, let's do both sides, we go, brush, point, head, Circle, we go brush. Back to the beginning, we go jab. Jab, really sharp. Cutting through the air. Whoosh. Now I want you to take those flash bulbs anywhere you want to send them, anywhere in the room. Try to shine light different parts of your room. Where do you want that light to appear? Maybe behind you. Maybe under you. Every time you flash your hands, you're shining a beautiful, strong beam of light. Good. Slow cymbal crash. Excellent. All right. 
Good. We're going to finish today um, with a little tribute to West Side Story. I don't know if any, anyone here knows West Side Story. It's a famous Broadway musical uh, by Leonard Bernstein. And uh, what's really cool about it is that it is based on the story of Romeo and Juliet by Shakespeare. Yesterday was Shakespeare's birthday. So I thought we would do a little tribute to, uh, to Shakespeare with a little West Side Story. And this is a story of two, two groups, two gangs who don't like each other, just like the Montagues and the Capulets. This is the Sharks and the Jets. So we are going to do a little bit of movement from West Side Story. The original choreography is by Jerome Robbins, very famous American choreographer. And um, we're going to bring back some elements that we've been working on. We've been doing some pointing, right? We've been doing our rhythm step, uh, our cha-cha. Now we're just going to take a step and clap. So open together. Open together. Open together. This is a scene from the show where it's called Cool, and there's a lot of tension, a lot of energy. They're, they're ready to fight each other, these two, these two groups. So there's a, there's a percussive element to the movement, and we're going to take that into our walks. So this is our walk. I call this a splat walk because, again, I'm dropping my feet into the floor like I did in the cha-cha, but I'm just keeping that rhythm going the whole time. I'm going to expand. I'm going to try to make myself seem bigger than I am. I'm trying to intimidate the other gang. And then I'm going to soften in, right? So the jets are intimidating the sharks. The sharks are intimidating the jets. And then I'm going to reach up as big as I can. I'm going to do a kind of an explosion. Pow! It's almost like a sculpture for a moment. You're finding that moment of strong, strong shape and a hold. Same thing on in another direction. You can decide any arms you'd like. There's no set pattern, but it has to be a growing and then pow, an explosion of energy. Again, I'm really using a wide base here for support so that I can do those big, strong movements. Those are the four elements. So our pointing, our rhythm step, our walking, and our expanding and contraction, and then our expanding and explosion. Okay? This is a jazz version of the original music for this called Cool. Starting with those points. Try to point at people at different levels, different places in the room. Keep it going. And we're gonna switch into our rhythm step. Here we go. Together. Open. Together. Good. Open. Together. Walking. Getting those feet down into the floor. Ready to expand. Open. And soften. One more time. Open. And soften. Now we're going to open. And pow! And open. And pow! Good, now too soft. One. In. Second one. Open. And soft. Now open. And pull! Nice. One more. Really strong. Open, 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 and pow. Back to the beginning. A little faster with our points. Going into our rhythm step.
Good. Ready to walk. Really getting that side to side motion in your body and we open and retreat. Just play it cool and softening down again. Yes, good. All right. Thank you all so much. Those of you who were willing to come and be seen and to dance together, thank you for, for, uh, for doing that and, and being part of the group. Um, I'm going to stop there. I, I could go on for another hour, but I'm going to stop because I want to make sure we have time for questions. Um, so uh, I'm just going to start to look at... Um, Let's see. Start to look at some questions. I um, I'm gonna start with a Gobin's question here, um, and this is maybe more a question for Dr. Barreto. But uh, Parkinson's is Parkinson's curable? I think the general answer is it's not curable, but there are many things that you can do to manage your Parkinson's well and uh, live well with Parkinson's for many years. So. We don't have the, the medicine, the medical science to turn it around to, to, to stop Parkinson's, but we do have a lot of information about how to live better and manage your Parkinson's uh, very well. So um, we're at a place where we can use a combination of medicine, surgery, um, and activities like dance and exercise to, to, to manage. Uh, Sardini has a question, the link of the music used during the activity and also the YouTube videos. Um, okay. So yes, the, um, for the, I, I'm happy to share all links with people. Uh, the first activity we did, which was this activity, the choreographer is Mark Morris. Uh, I will put that in, um, chat. And um, the music link I can certainly share. It is, but it's pretty easy to find. It's the third suite for. By J.S. Bach. Um, okay. So yeah, so that music is, is a, this was a piece that Yo-Yo Ma commissioned he asked mark morris to choreograph a dance version of it and um and so the music is was from a project that yo-yo ma did called inspired by bach it's the six cello suites of bach and there's a different artist who interpreted each of those suites so there's a choreographer a filmmaker a theater director a landscape architect various artistic approaches to to that work all right um is there a time-bound schedule? This is from K.L. Vidur. Um, and thank you for the kind words. It is a great method to stay active. Um, I, I hope you found that too. Is there any time-bound schedule to follow as a routine? That's a great question. I would say from a dance perspective, it's good to try to do a little bit of dancing every day. Um, <clears throat> we, again, we are offering classes on Zoom pretty much every day and a lot of our participants are coming three to four times a week, but it it really depends on you. I think a lot of times you will find that there's a good time of day where you feel you feel better and you feel more open to moving. I would try to, and, and sometimes that is dependent on medication schedules. So I would try to find the same time every day and commit to doing maybe even just 20 minutes of of a dance activity about what we just we did about half an hour today um but just uh you know it doesn't have to be a whole hour i think the important thing is is to do a little bit every day rather than doing an hour at once and then not doing it for a few days right because you're so tired so i because the thing with dance is it's not just about the physical it's also about the cognitive exercise so our, our brains want to be stimulated and exercised every day. 
with new ideas. So even doing the same routine, but with different music or at a slightly different speed can be very, very helpful um, from the cognitive standpoint. Okay, uh, great. Um, Dr. Tarkude, thank you so much. Thank you for your kind words. Uh, can you show a dance for simple actions like walking, getting up from bed, getting up from a chair? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I can show uh, a, a couple of ideas. What I find really useful um, for, uh, for walking is uh, what you just saw really, is, is finding music and using this idea of a splat walk. So I'm going to, um, I'm gonna just remind us of that here. Let me just go into a different view. Um, so for example, instead of, instead of a walk that um, is just sort of like this, right? Where I, I'm not really specific in my activity, I want to think about really lifting and then dropping my foot. Now, you may not want to walk around your town like this, but it's a great way to practice at home, to start to get that sense of rhythm into your step. And of course, at home, I would say many people are, are actually more prone to falling at home because they're just, they're not thinking about it. They're not on guard um, and they're, they're relaxed. So that's when falls can, can sometimes be a little bit more common. So at home, you might want to think about that kind of strong walk and maybe put some music on to help you reinforce that, that walking. Sometimes I also recommend stepping and touching together. So really feeling that sense of base. Um, the key thing here is to keep a wide base and to use knee bends. One, one of the things we do in class is something from the ballet tradition, which is called plie. Um, and I know having done some, um, some katak warm up as well, that knee bends are a big part of the training. So even standing behind a chair like this and, um, and practicing, practicing bending, and gently stretching your knees. This will start to build up strength in your legs. And so when you are walking, you are using the bend of your knees to support you. And when, if you start to be unsteady, it also gives you that strength to be able to catch yourself and support yourself as you do that. In terms of getting out of the chair, a couple of methods. I tend to recommend, um, rotating this way so that you can use the back of the chair for support. And then I like a rocking action. So getting some momentum in your body and then taking a moment here. This is probably the most important part of getting out of the chair. If you can practice rocking into this and holding this for a moment, you're going to be building up strength to do that with more ease. And then eventually, maybe the third or fourth time, you're going to be pressing up. Now, the great thing about this is that I'm still connected to the chair. So if I feel imbalanced, I always have that support right here to hold, to hold myself, right? And then I can continue around to the back of the chair if I wanted to do more activities. Um, you can do that straight on with a simple swing, right? And then pressing down on the chair, catching yourself here, and slowly coming up. If you're feeling unsteady, I also recommend putting a chair or having somebody put a chair in front of you, and you can practice this way, right? So that as you push forward, you have a chair here, and you can use that for support. I would say that uh, getting out of a chair and practicing that skill is one of the most important things that we can do to prevent falls. And, and so practicing at that midway point where you're not all the way up, but you're not touching the chair, that's where you're going to find that, oh, that really, uh, the, the strength building part of the class. Yep. Um, so, Gastori, uh, I hope that helps a little bit. You can use those same techniques for, uh, for getting out of bed. Um, bed can sometimes be a little bit lower depending on your bed or higher, but the same, that sense of rocking and then finding that, um, 
that preliminary point where you're you're just off the just off the bed or off the chair, but you're using your hands to support yourself a little bit, or holding the the bed the the headboard um, to support you. So I hope that is is up. Um, I can you know in terms of sequences, I think the key is designing something for yourself. So what I just showed you in terms of like rocking four times, rocking to a uh, preliminary position, you know, four times, and then making your way up. And then once you're up, if you can come back down and do that sequence again, because I will see people who are, they're pretty good at getting out of the chair, but then when they're, when they're going to sit, they do something like this. Right? Does that look familiar? You've seen people do that? So we have to practice this part of sitting down, and it's the same principle. You go to that point, make sure you're connected, make sure you feel the chair, and work your way back. So that would be my sequence, right? Rocking, or doing it this way, rocking, rocking to a half chair, going all the way up, and then going backwards, going to here, couple times and then going all the way down and I would repeat that and if you do that over time you will build strength and you will help yourself prevent um, prevent unnecessary falls all right um, let's see uh, Vonita hey Vonita um, I know Vonita well I mentioned that any dance form is good is they all have the same elements um, so the reason that there is um, there is so much attention on tango is mostly due to what we call um, research bias. The people who uh, were really interested in looking at a, um, a rigorous research methodology for dance happen to be tango dancers. It's not necessarily that tango is better than other forms. It's just that there's been more, a little bit more research on tango than other forms. So people have concluded, therefore, that tango is better. But tango shares many of the same elements um, that other forms do, and they just there hasn't been as much research because the researchers for those forms are not as um, as passionate about about those forms as as the tango researchers are. So it's really it's mostly a bias. Um, Tango is very good, and we know that it's good, and it's supported by the evidence. But so is so are many forms of dance from around the world. Um, we just there hasn't been research funding behind them, um, and so the elements that you have in tango: weight shift, um, walking, a lot of walking in tango, balance. Those things are present in many other forms of dance. So. Um, that's it. <laughs> um, Vandana. Uh, great. Yes. Could you tell if the dance activity is done along with some speech or talking to help with? Okay. Great question. The, the short answer of this is yes, but I would, <clears throat> I would heart, heartily recommend singing instead of talking. Um, uh, this is mostly because when you're dealing with talking and movement, you're asking people to do multitasking, dual tasking. And this can be very challenging. So t in the research that I've seen done at the University of Wa uh, Washington University in St. Louis, they did a study comparing people who walked and talked and people who walked and sang with Parkinson's. And the people who walked and sang had a much easier time coordinating both activities and doing them together than the people who walked and talked. Walking and talking, people usually had to stop walking and just talk or they had to walk and not talk. But the people who walked and sung and sang, they were able to do both. So singing is great for breath control, for facial expression, as you say, for speech, for masked face. Um, so we do a lot of singing in our program, but we do it while we're dancing, and we try to do it with music that people know and can sing along with, so they're not having to choose one cognitive task over the other, they're able to do both together. So yes, and singing and dancing is great. Um, uh, Jagmohan, thank you so much for your response. Uh, Sneha, does dance help with dyskinesia? Great question. What I've, uh, when I've spoken to people in our program 
who have dyskinesia, what they say is they love the fact that dance gives their movements meaning and uh, a sort of form. I think often people with dyskinesia feel that their their bodies are uh, not as controlled as they want them to be. And dance gives a form and a shape to those extra movements. Um, we have one person in our class in particular who was a professional dancer, has a lot of dyskinesia with his Parkinson's, and he loves the class because in class he can move big, he can move with his dyskinesia, and it gives him a sense of control. It gives him something to do with those extra movements. And I notice the dyskinesia becomes less pronounced when somebody is dancing because it it gives them, again, a, a form to hold on to rather than sort of the more pedestrian movements that we do every day where there isn't really anything for us to do with our arms. So sometimes those the dyskinetic movements become more obvious. In a dance class, our full body is moving the whole time. So in a way, it kind of uh, absorbs the dyskinesia. Um, it, uh, let's see, um, any dance movement before getting up from a chair. So I gave you some activities, but I think that the, um, the, f the strong foot movements into the floor, whether that's a West Side Story or Katak, um, those are really good for bringing awareness to your feet, building up that sense of connection to the floor, and then um, preparing the feet to take weight. Because unfortunately, it's really our feet that are doing the, the bulk of the activity. I also like this kind of thing where um, you have a nice wide base of support and you are reaching and leaning into that support, right? Um, you can even lift up and press into one side, lift up and press to start to open the hips and get that sense of a wide base. Um, so pressing out and coming back. All of this stuff that we did a little bit of in the beginning is really good for preparing to stand. And then of course our rocking action. When you do stand though, I would do some activities behind the chair. I talked about plies, right? Knee bends. I would also think about doing some walking behind the chair to some music that you like to start to get that sense of lifting your feet off the floor that sense of rhythmic walking. You're really trying to re-inscribe a sense of music and rhythm in your body. You know, and the more that you can practice that, the better. Uh, I'm going to wrap things up pretty quickly, but uh, Krishnaraj asking about online classes. Yes, our online classes, I will post a website for anyone who's interested. I'm not sure the time is going to work because the earliest class we have is at 11 o'clock which is, and your time is, is a little bit late, but all of our online classes are free. We do have some people from India who are currently coming into those classes, so all of you are welcome to participate. There is no charge. You just have to be able to access Zoom, um, and I will, I will post, uh, post a link to that right now. Okay, give me one second. I just want to get the correct uh, correct tag so that you're ending up on the exact right page here. Okay, so this is the page of all of our at-home resources, and um, you'll see there are some on-demand videos if you want to dance sort of on your own time. Um, don't have to, to do a scheduled class, but you'll also see below that um, – sorry, above those classes, you'll see the schedule for the week. And all of those classes are posted in New York time, which right now is nine and a half hours behind uh, India standard time. Okay, so just be aware of that time zone difference. Uh, thank you, Navaz, Navez, for your beautiful words. Thank you so much. Can dance therapy used with children with special needs? Yes, that is actually a huge area of work, is um, dance for children on the autism spectrum, um, dance for kids with Down syndrome. So yes, absolutely. Uh, for Manasi, please uh, contact me if you want more resources. I'm going to... Uh, Navaz, you asked about um, activities like... Uh, I will post a link in chat, sorry. Uh, all panelists and attendees. There we go. Okay. Um, Activities like brushing, combing, 
build a dance for yourself that incorporates these movements. You know, find music that you like and create, think about that choreography, right? Thinking about the choreography of daily movements, brushing, looking at your watch, right? Pouring your tea. You can make any of those movements a dance by thinking about your phrasing and finding music that supports those movements, right? We use a lot of everyday gesture in our classes and I recommend you, you can do that at home. You don't need me, but we are, if you come into one of our classes, we will kind of incorporate a lot of everyday, everyday gesture. I'm gonna stop there. I think I got to most questions, but I wanna thank Dr. Beretta for the wonderful uh, opportunity to share with, with you and with your staff and all of your wonderful attendees. And I wanna thank, uh, Tijali for hosting and for providing support today. Thank you so much, David. It was a splendid workshop of one and a half hours. And uh, we were we didn't just keep a track of the time in this workshop. And we were we thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed this. And I, I can assure that everyone who participated in this workshop thoroughly enjoyed this one. Thank you so much. And we were so happy to have uh, David Leventhal, who is a founding teacher, the award-winning program director for Dance for PD, a program uh, of the Mark Morris Dance Group that has been used as a model for classes in more than 300 communities in 25 countries. And he's also co-produced five volumes of successful instructional video series and helped conceive and design Moving Through Class, a dance-based Google app for people with Parkinson's. And David has also uh, won prestigious awards like Martha Hill uh, Mid-Career Award, the 2016 World Parkinson's Congress Award for Distinguished Contribution to the Parkinson's Community, and is also a co-recipient of the 2013 Alan Bonander Humanitarian Award for the Parkinson's uh, from the Parkinson's Unity Walk. So we were really, really fortunate to have you here, and thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Uh, Dr. Pareto. Uh, that was an amazing session, enjoyable and really motivating, David. I'm sure our members are going to be sending in innumerable requests for more dance and movement sessions. And yes, we must research Indian dance forms and we'll look for opportunities, mainly funding to make it possible. We have initiated a few pilot studies, but must take this forward. Thank you. And let's hope we can find ways to work together. Have a wonderful like day because I know it is the beginning of your day. And for all our participants, have a wonderful evening. Thank you, David. And thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. My pleasure. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, so if anyone is new to PDMDS and would like to avail any of the free services that we offer, which includes weekly online exercise sessions, information on management of Parkinson's, phone counseling with, for people with Parkinson's and their caregivers and special online sessions for caregivers, please do, please do get in touch with us. These are our contact details. You can contact us uh, on phone, email, you can also visit our website, which is parkinsonsocietyindia.com, or you can follow us on any of the social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And we have another exciting webinar happening tomorrow for the young onset people with Parkinson's, the young onset Parkinson's experiences and challenges, and which is being uh, conducted by two amazing speakers, Omitola Thomas and Dr. Shanti Priya who are also uh, young onset people with Parkinson's, but uh, they are inspirational speakers and uh, they are promoting the cause of Parkinson's through their own organizations. So please do register for this event if you haven't registered so far. And we look forward to seeing you all tomorrow for this amazing webinar. These are our contact details again. And thank you so much everybody for joining us with us today. Thank you.